Today I will make a little speech about the bonsai seasons and how trees develop during the season. And there's a big difference if it is a deciduous tree or an evergreen like this. And it is taking a little bit the offspring of the Schoenberg through the seasons, but there's basically uh, all kinds of bonsai, it's the same things that happens. All, uh, also, it's just a, a little bit more delicate when we're talking about Schoen bonsai. So we'll go, tr go through that. A deciduous tree like this and a flowering tree and a conifer with green foliage all the time is that this goes uh, very, when it goes dormant, it drops its leaves and you have to treat it different than an evergreen. It's the same thing that happens when we start uh, going into the winter. The uh, mass of the flow of uh, oxygen, the, fl uh, the flow of water and uh, nutrients will slow down very much at an evergreen and totally stop at a deciduous, deciduous tree because it has no leaves to make the, to transpire the water. Here it will still go on, but very slowly, depending on the seasonal changes. This year has been uh, very, very different from all other seasons in, in uh, where I live in Denmark. From uh, September until now, it has been raining nonstop. So for the first time ever, all my trees, except uh, one or two who is more delicate, I have let them outside all the year. That's the first time ever because we had maybe two or three nights uh, just below zero and that's it. And this Crataegus is going into leaf uh, very, very early at the season. You can see it has been outside all the season and it's still going into leaf at this moment. Normally it will be uh, late March or something like that. So we are really in an early stage here. And as you can see, it is, is wired totally. And I did that in the autumn. When you are dealing with the city trees, that is the perfect time to put on wire and begin to bend branches. Uh, you could do it during the summer as well. The only problem is that you cannot see what you're doing because it's full of leaves. That's why we do it in the autumn but before the winter, simply because when, you, when the leaves drop, the branches are still flexible. If you wait until December or January, uh, when the sap flow is almost uh, at a zero, the branches become stiffer and you risk to break them if you begin to wire them in the middle of the winter. You can do that with an evergreen because it still has some kind of flow and the branches are a little bit more soft and more flexible that tolerates more. And another point to, to, to notice is when you wire a bonsai, we sometimes have a tendency to, we will have two or three branches that are not in the right position. We would like to correct that. But if you wire only a few branches, especially if they are weaker branches, that means uh, branches placed lower uh, or don't have the same strength and as in the top, you have a 50% chance of them dying off. Therefore, it is advisable to wait to wire until you wire the whole tree. That will give a much better balance within the tree. If every branch is wired and put in position at once, you will equalize the balance and not weaken weak branches and risk them to die off. That's an important point. It's very often seen that you just adjust one or two branches and say, I just need to do that. But there is a risk in that if the branch is not very healthy growing. Also, if you want to adjust uh, branches that are weak, then wait until they get stronger. So leave them alone, even if it doesn't look good. The only time you actually need a tree to look perfect is when it's going into an exhibition. All the other times, it is about balancing growth and developing them. Uh, much too many enthusiasts have, have trees that they try to put uh, every branch and every uh, foliage in the perfect position all the time, but then you risk uh, not the life of the tree, but you risk to damage some parts of the tree. So it's much more wise to wait until you need to do things. So there's uh, a constant balance between being uh, an artist who wants to create something that is beautiful and being a gardener who takes care of the health 
and, and the well-being of the tree. So you have to balance these two things all the time. Sometimes you're just the gardener who puts all the efforts in getting the tree to grow and balance the energy. And at other times when you have achieved this point, then you can begin to be the artist who creates. If we take uh, this juniper, which is this one actually, <laughs> I styled this uh, a little over a year ago. And then I left it to just being in peace and doing nothing else. And what I have done to being both creative and taking care of the health of the tree at the same time is I have arranged the foliage as I want it to be in two or three years. It means it will still develop. So the only thing I have done is I have placed all the, the main branches in the position I want them to be. And the next thing to do is begin to adjust the finer details. It's especially at the lower points, I have been more careful uh, how I bend the branches than at the top. So sometimes it's also about developing a tree all over two or three or four or five steps, not trying to do a final result uh, at once. So it's better to think at the health of the tree, placing the branches in somewhat the position you want, and then after some time when new growth appear, you can begin to refine it. Uh, what happens uh, in nearly all kinds of trees is that they are apical dominant. That means all the strongest growth is at the top of the tree. It goes for big bonsai and for small bonsai. So all of the strength is here and here. And lower down, you have a weaker branch. So you have to always uh, balance the energy in the tree. And that means being pruned a little harder at the top and let the bottom grow more freely. And with time, you will be able to, you will be able to balance these things. And uh, there's no uh, exact recipe about how much can I prune this tree at this point and how much can I prune this. It's a matter of experience. You know when you failed uh, and you're not always sure why you succeeded. So it's a matter of balance over time. Another way to, to balance a tree and the energy is uh, by, if you want to weaken the top part of the tree to strengthen the lower part, so you have this balance. You can either prune this harder or you can bend some of the branches down and let these grow a little up. Then you secure the same kind of strength all over the tree. It is different with a deciduous tree where you prune it it will not help to bend these branches uh, very much down. It will not uh, change much of the energy. So you have to prune them back instead and let some of the smaller grow. I have a very, very, if you can see it, I have a very tiny bud growing here. And it has been, it has been almost not developing for two or three years. It appeared, it appeared two or three years ago and I thought, well, it would, it would be very nice to have a branch growing in this direction and develop here and be in position. If it ever will happen, I'm not sure because it almost do not grow. And that is because all the energy goes to the thicker branches where there's a, a better flow of energy. When you are developing, uh, one of the important things to develop in a bonsai is constantly to regrow branches at the lower parts and in the inner parts so you don't have a tree that just outgrow its shape with time. So you have to cut the outer grow at some time and let the new ones inside take over. And uh, at the city tree, you do that by cutting away in the late spring or midsummer, and then you push something new inside here and you will get light inside. The difference from pruning at a deciduous tree and an evergreen is especially at a juniper, all the energy is stored in the tips of the branches. So if you constantly prune away the tips to keep a neat image, you remove, remove all the energy that will produce new buds back. So in opposition to a deciduous tree where you prune back to force new growth back, you do the opposite with a juniper. You let the tips grow because, because that drags all the water and all the nutrients through the branches 
and if they get light, they will sprout the new buds back. So if you are too hard on them, you will just set them back. So it's actually a little bit the opposite uh, technique for the citrus tree and the juniper. And if we can find earlier this season, uh, I will see if I can find something that looks like a new rose. It's maybe a little, little too early, but we have maybe a small shoot here. It's, it's uh, like an arrow form shoot and it will elongate now. So what I need to do later in the season where it has grown maybe like this, then I cut it back. But I wait until it has developed because then it drags all the energy up through the branches and it will be able to back part. And then I remove it. What you should never do is pinching. If, if you pinch the tips with your fingers, uh, you risk uh, two things. The first thing is you stress the tree and it will not grow well and you remove all the energy that is stored out here. And the second thing is it looks ugly because it turns brown. So instead, take the long new shoots and cut them back at the base and, you, and keep the round folders that we need to make a pretty image. And if we look inside the tree here, you can see how I have uh, opened it up when I styled it the first time. And at the open spaces, at the bare branches, Later this season, it will begin to show new growth that can, and they can take over from the foliage out here. So it's, it's constantly about renewing the growth. And this is uh, something I will perform, I don't know this year, because this year is strange, so maybe it will be early, but uh, around summertime, then it has gained all the strength it needs, and then I can begin to remove some of the strong branches, uh, new shoots. And uh, just for the sake of it, I have not repotted it either. Because when you begin to style a tree and begin to bend all these branches, they become weak because you, you put a pressure on them. And every time you make a little bit of a turn of a branch, you break the small cells and tissue inside, and it needs time to recover. And it is weak in a tree every time you turn a branch and therefore, it's always important when, when you put a wire on a branch and put it in position, do it in one go. Do not put it like there and then decide, no, that was not good. I put it in the other direction because then the, you break the tissue at both sides and you risk it to, to dry out and simply die. So put the wire on, know what you will do and do it in one go. And that's it. And if you make a failure, let it sit and make it over next year. That's a slow process, but it's a secure process. And that is the same with the citrus trees. And they are even a little bit more fragile. A juniper is quite flexible. A pine will be quite flexible. Uh, some of the, uh, another point is the older the trees are, the less you can do. Because the branches of uh, this crater egos is, is very brittle. If I do something now, I'm sure it will break the wire later this season when the leaves are beginning to open and I know that the cells begins to expand because they take up a lot of water. So I have to do it before it bites into the branch. Actually, it's opposite. The branch goes around the wire because it expands. And I always cut it off instead of trying to rewind it because then I risk to remove some parts and I risk to, to break the branch. And uh, this tree is pretty old. It has been growing in this pot for maybe 20 years. Not exactly this pot, but in a pot for 20 years. And it was uh, as smooth as of his fingers, uh, the bark at that time. And the only way you get uh, an old aged bark on a tree like this is to wait. It's only time. It's the influence, uh, the moist in the weather. It's the sun and the wind. And maybe if we have winters, it's the ice and the snow that forms the bark, it gets moist, it dries out, and it gets influenced by the weather, and then with time it gets this old age bark. And that just takes time. On a juniper, you will never get the same kind of bark. It's just a different growth it has. It, it will have a more smooth bark, and some people at exhibitions prefer to remove, brush off the flakes of the bark and oil them and make them with uh, light brown color as a contrast to uh, the dead wood. 
I'm not so much into that. I like, I can see uh, the edge of the park, but that's a ma matter of tastes and traditions. And, but the most important thing is to take care of the dead wood. Uh, use some lime sulfur, who is killing uh, fungus, and prevent it from rotting. But especially if you have a risk of having some soil contact that can uh, speed up the pro process of rotting. It is uh, pretty hard wood on this one, so it will, uh, it will stay uh, without decaying for a long time. But the younger a tree is, the more soft the dead wood is. And therefore, it will be more difficult to keep dead wood on a younger tree. At a deciduous tree, here's also some dead wood because the, originally the branch, the, the trunk was chopped and split to, to make it more dramatic and to force some new growth. And I, I treated it with lime sulfur maybe twice in 20 years because the wood is so hard, so it doesn't rot. It's simply uh, hard as a stone, so nothing will happen. Maybe in, in five years' time I will give it just to be secure, but it doesn't look very good on a deciduous tree. It's more a natural look at, at a, a conifer. But that, again, is a matter of taste and what you like, but I prefer it is a little bit more gray-brown fitting a flowering tree. And talking about flowering trees uh, and the seasons, uh, I have read a, a lot about people saying, uh, when, when should you repot a flowering tree? And often we say after it has flowered, but with a hawthorn like this that flowers in July, uh, I, I would not repot it after flowering. So what I do and find is uh, the most logical thing to do and has worked very well for me, is to say the year that it flowers and I allow it to flower, I will not repot it. So the year you repot, you remove all flower buds. Just take them off so you don't uh, use the energy for flowers. And another, a little bit of a myth, I think, about a flowering bonsai is that the flowers take away the energy from the tree. But that, that is not really the point. The point is, where you have flowers, you will not have new growth. And if you not have new growth, you will not expand the volume and you will not have as much photosynthesis as if you have more leaves. So the flowers themselves will not take up a lot of energy. It will certainly not kill a tree because why should they flower in nature? It makes no sense. But as a bonsai where we trim them and they have a minimum of branches, it is wise to have a balance between growth and when the tree is allowed to flower. So trees in development where we want an, a lot of new branch formation at a young tree, for example, or an older tree where I want it to flower, that year I will not repot it. And I know this year it will probably come up with a lot of flowers. I'm not sure because I cannot see it yet. But it didn't flower last year. And many deciduous trees and flowering trees have a habit of having a strong season with a lot of flowers, and then the next season they want to regain the strength and therefore they decide, if you could say so, to not flower as much to regain the strength by having more leaves and more photosynthesis. That's a difference. So it's very important for me not to repot the same year it has flowered or at least just remove the flower that one year. And again, this is about uh, planning. When does the tree have to shine on an exhibition? Uh, and if you're not into doing exhibitions, it's just about keeping a balance between when does it uh, flowers and looks good and when is it just in between in training periods. And the same goes with the deciduous trees. You have to uh, make a cyclus where you think about the health of the tree and when it has to look good. And when we come through to the summer, it's uh, much about watering and uh, not so much about uh, growth because when you reach the middle of the summer, you have a semi-dormant period for all kinds of trees. Even in, in the tropics, if you have ficus, they will have a, a period, even if they don't drop the leaves, where they are growing slower because they need to rest exactly like humans. We need to sleep to, to regain strength to be active. And the same goes for the trees. They just do it in the season twice. Of course, in the winter, 
where they stop almost completely, but they have a semi-dormant period in summer. And that is also a good time uh, if, you, if you defoliate a Japanese maple, for example, you can wire it at that time if you that, do that in early summer. And you can do the same if you pinch out a juniper and want to wire it. It's a good time because it grows slow. And uh, another point about the uh, deciduous trees is also uh, leaf defoliation is a very good technique if you have a healthy tree to get a mass, a, a, a new growth in, in the big numbers. If you defoliate a, a Japanese maple totally, it will come with a lot of new leaves and a lot of, lot of new buds. But again, it is about what kind of tree is it? Is it a young tree where you need this? Or is it an older tree where you only need to refine it? So if you take an old Japanese maple, very well developed with a lot of ramification, and totally defoliated, you will get a lot of new growth, but it will be too much and you will not be able to keep the tree in, in the, the right design. So it's always a matter of where are the tree in its development? Is it young? Is it on the way to go to an exhibition and be as perfect as it can be? Or is it in a, a training period? Everything is related to that. And then we reach uh, autumn and everything slows down again and the year starts again and the good time to again wire a deciduous tree is when the leaves begins to drop. Cut the last one off before they drop and wire the tree if you need to because then the branches are flexible. And another reason to remove all the leaves uh, when they drop is uh, to secure you have no fungus during winter so you have no dead leaves attracting insects or fungus during the the winter. So clean them up so they are uh, staying healthy over winter. And then the year starts again. And this is just a brief explanation of what is happening. So if you have any questions, just come on. What point would you put uh, the trees in the greenhouse? What temperature? Oh, when will I put the trees in, in the greenhouse? Well, I I, I will always let my trees get a little bit of freezing because it kills uh, some of the bugs that might, in, in this old uh, cracky bark, they can sit all kinds of small insects and trying to overwinter there. And they may uh, cause some fungus when they die. But if they get a little bit of freezing, minus one or two will not harm a tree at all. They can, they can cope that for maybe a week without problem. The biggest problem about freezing is, is um, not that uh, at a hawthorn or a juniper, they can easily cope with it. The problem comes when the soil freezes and they cannot drag up any water. Because if you have a juniper and you have a little bit of sunshine, the leaves, the foliage mass will heat up and it needs uh, to evaporate water to cool it down, like, like when we are sweating. And if they cannot get any water, they will, they will still evaporate, but the water doesn't come up to... to, uh, to uh, what, what do you say, to replace the water that is gone, and then they, they are not dying of freezing, they're, di they're drying out. That's the difference. It's even, even a deciduous tree without leaves will still have a little bit of evaporation out of the branches. It will happen all the time, and of course from the soil. And this year I did not put any of my trees in a greenhouse. They have stayed all out all because we had only two or three nights with a little bit of freezing, freezing, so there was no reason to do it. When I, when I take them inside, so when, when I leave them out in, in this winter, I just left them outside on the benches. Then we had uh, some stormy days as rain, so I put them on the shelter to take off the rain and just to secure they are not blowing away. If you, if you have a heavy winter. I, I take them in a greenhouse and store them there simply to protect them. And, but la bigger trees you can put on the ground so they get a little bit of the heat from the ground. There's a very, very big difference of having a, a pot standing in the wind, being cooled off, cooling down the roots, and having it on the ground that get a little bit of heat from the ground. Uh, and when we talk about that, an important point in the summer, is that when, when you have the sun on a pot like this, it will heat up very fast. 
and you will have a risk of the almost the roots cooking. So it's very important to move the trees during the season so they get uh, partial shade in the middle of the day so you not boil up the, the roots. Roots in a tree, in nature, in the ground will have a very steady temperature. The ground temperature, if you just go a few inches down, will have uh, almost the same temperature during the season. It will change very, very slowly. But in a pot like this, it goes up and down during the day and the night. So therefore, it's important to try to keep them uh, in a stable temperature by putting them in partial shade in the middle of the day and avoid uh, the warm uh, evening sun uh, at the sundown because the tree has been cooked up all day and needs to cool down. I, I move the trees during the season, okay. I, actually, I do. I start with, depending where the sun comes from, I put all my uh, evergreen trees so they get as much light as possible and when I reach the midsummer, I begin to move them around so I can find a spot for them. As much as I can stand in the shadow of a bigger tree and so on, simply to protect them from, uh, so they get an even temperature as much as possible. Yeah? Okay? Thanks, Martin. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.